Please welcome Leah Rico on stage, and Leah will speak to us about radical pedagogy. Hon kommer att prata lite grann om både utbildning och riktiga eh, experiment som hon gör ute och övningar som hon gör ute. Hon har grundat något som heter My Green Favela som är väldigt intressant och också med mycket inslag av kreativa saker. Så, so, welcome Leah. The stage you. is yours. My name's Lee, and tonight I'll present a range of arts-based projects that have inspired me to think creatively about my relationship to working in the environment. My work involves formulating uh, creative strategies for working in systems that are under extreme socio-environmental stress in different international contexts, and often include designing and implementing educational outreach programs. Now, cultural readings of the sciences have traditionally been met with suspicion. Yet the foundation of creative problem solving is often an ability to move between one communication knowledge system or another and to create a bridging discourse between the two. So the examples I'll present tonight are mostly concerned with life on earth, um, because that's where I work, on the land. Uh, and some of these examples may be things that you can integrate into your, into your classroom or may be valuable as case studies um, and others are just sort of kooky things that I connect to that make me think creatively about the work that I do. Um, and so these things may range tonight from urban density to activism. And soil is a big part of the discussion on sustainability. Now, for years, the artist Laura Parker has travelled around holding various soil tasting events. And uh, she, she teaches about how we can learn how to taste a place. Um, you know, just a generation ago, farmers always held the soil in their mouths uh, to decide, you know, to, to be able to discern how valuable it was, how, what it could grow. Um, but now we don't even know what we're putting into our bodies, let alone how to connect to how, it, how it's grown in the soil. So this is her way of connecting to engaging with the subject of soil. Another issue we face is a loss of traditional knowledge. And one project that I collaborated on um, with the Patasho Indians in Brazil was to produce a biomedicinal teaching kit um, that was distributed to the indigenous, sco indigenous schools in the region. And I use them in workshops uh, both there and, and in Rio de Janeiro with the, uh, in the favelas or the slums. Um, and they can be created even with the students and used in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, they can be as simple as like tasting different teas or making topical tinctures uh, for healing or inflammation, whatever context. Um, some of my work also involves creating um, seed bombs in workshops. They're a great, uh, useful, uh, hands-on strategies uh, to use in countries like Egypt and Kenya, where local farming has, has suffered a lot from genetically mod modified monoculture. And, uh, and so this is like a bottom-up tactic that avoids a purely theoretical approach to engaging communities to tackle these issues. Now, in the context of the resource-rich global north, these sorts of projects can take on a more playful approach. And this group uses uh, seed bomb dispensing machines to teach alternative education and urban ecology. Uh, the dispensers are loaded with native seed mixes uh, that are created for particular bioregions. And the plantings can be annotated on Google Maps by students. And this is a good way to teach also about social entrepreneurship and raise money for classroom projects. And there are also numerous fun variations uh, on how students can design and implement their own uh, seed dispensing or seed bomb mechanisms. Um, in a very simple form, ice can be, can be used to capture and time release seeds in rivers and as a tool for uh, reforesting riverbanks. That's a great project that this artist works with a lot with her with kids in uh, New Mexico. And uh, this artist, Simon Starling, uh, his, his project was very high profile and, and really rather poorly thought out. 
He produced a floating garden of rhododendrons to be released on a lock in Scotland. Uh, it was a tremendously funded project by the Scottish National Heritage, but before it could be launched, they withdrew the funding because they realised that they'd just spent more than £5 million trying to eradicate this invasive weed from their, from their country. So there is a need to interrogate uh, your, your projects before you do launch them. I guess that's the moral of that story. So bioremediation is also an interesting topic to explore. For example, sunflowers float on rafts, um, polystyrene rafts, um, to suck up radiation at a pond uh, on, a, a, on a pond near Chernobyl, and they're also planted at Fukushima. There's lots of good like online resources, teaching resources for bioremediation that you might want to engage with. Um, another project that I worked on in the US was um, with the Navajos who uh, remediated, who used native plants to remediate um, uh, contaminated radioactive sites. And I orchestrated a project uh, with youth and indigenous leaders for them to make films about this and other environmental issues they face and then distribute them to the community. Uh, now everybody has a cell phone since this was done and it's much easier. And for the younger kids, we also held animation workshops so they could create environmental films and learn animation skills at the same time. Another project that I've been involved in is um, using old uh, webcams, to, uh, hacking webcams to create DIY microscopes. And uh, these can be easily done with kids and um, they make beautiful films and, and you can really explore on a different scale um, you know, plant and, and animal life uh, in water. Uh, this artist, Sarah Peebles, um, has an apiology project where she um, creates uh, um, uh, pollinator stations with students in Toronto. And uh, so, so they create these uh, sort of stations to monitor wild pollinators in non-invasive ways throughout their life cycles. And this has been integrated into the school system in Toronto. Um, audio monitoring devices have been used in hives since the 50s as well. Um, honeybees use vibrations uh, to, as a way to communicate because like, their hums are generated by their wings and abdomens as they work because they don't have ears. And they modify their beeswax to their wax comb um, for it to more effectively conduct vibrations. So it's 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 interesting to start putting like little uh, contact mics in the in the hives and uh, and start to work with students that way. Sound artists such as David Dunn work also work in the field of acoustic ecology and they record and catalogue sounds of uh, natural ecosystems using contact mics. Um, David Dunn's been investigating bioacoustics of bark beetles in pinion pines in northern New Mexico and now he advises the forestry department on potential fire surges when there's, um, when there's forest fires and he also monitors now uh, deforestation and climate change through bioacoustics, through insect activity and from this stuff he composes gorgeous soundscapes. So this stuff can be unpacked in different ways you know, in and out of the classroom. Um, a very different case that could be unpacked in the classroom is public smog. This was a temporary clean air park demarcated in the atmosphere um, and its parameters fluctuated according to financial, legal and political activities that regulated its use. The artist attempted to have the entire atmosphere recognised by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site and she purchased carbon credits from emission trading markets and withheld them from polluting industries. And her efforts also sought to expand the public domain of uh, the concept of public dom domain and pollution control initiatives as they currently exist in the legal framework in which they exist. Um, exploring another legal tactic, this artist uh, uh, stopped an oil corporation from putting a pipeline through his property by copyright copywriting his entire farm as an artwork. Uh, so mining companies can lay claim to private property through a legal process known as eminent domain. And this allows um, corporations and the government to go in there and uh, take land from owners without consent. 
uh, and pay them fair market value for it, but by copywriting his land, the artist not only made it a violation uh, to disturb his property, but he also drastically increased the financial remuneration that the companies must pay him if they still wish to go ahead and, and lay claim to it. So it's the difference between companies paying him $200 for loss of cropland or $600,000 for an artistic property disturbance. And he also charges them 500 bucks an hour if they want to talk to him about it. <laughs> so many citizen groups are now sort of also coming up with creative projects to obstruct pipelines. This group, there's a group of uh, Nebraskan farmers that have just laid a mile and a half of solar panels across their land to stop the Keystone XL and also provide clean power back to the grid. Uh, nuns build a chapel uh, in the path of a proposed pipeline in Pennsylvania on their land. And another group built a replica of Thoreau's Walden Cabin uh, along the proposed pipeline route in Massachusetts. So these are all important creative resistance strategies that make it more difficult for companies to tear through land. This is an older project. Uh, this artist, um, uh, loved playing the game Second Life. Uh, it's now an abandoned 3D world, but at the time it was inhabited by the avatars of millions of individuals. And the artist created uh, this project by fundraising through the, ga the game's online community to create a carbon offset program for the game's computer servers. And he used this money to uh, create to reforest this, this plot of land in Manila in the Philippines, which is now maintained and is self uh, self sufficient or self sustainable by residents. This vertical garden was a large scale art installation that grew vegetables and clusters out of repurposed cardboard planters. It had all other kinds of fancy stuff going on, but the produce was uh, used in local restaurants and sold in local markets, and these ideas were subsequently adapted into an underserved public school um, in Brooklyn, in New York. Um, a project I founded, uh, Green My Favela, is an urban restoration project based in the favelas of Rio in Brazil, and it develops gardens with residents in communities of the city. And some of the gardens are food gardens, some are focused on creating therapeutic spaces for favela residents. And these gardens make a huge difference to the health and the aesthetic value of public space in areas that are hyper-urbanised and typically have little green space. And they help significantly reduce stress and hypertension of the people that work in them and live nearby and they provide a safer place to kids to play and to learn about uh, sustainability and food production. So essentially, uh, Green My Favela works with residents to, form tra uh, to transform places uh, that look like this into places that look like this. This is the same space. Uh, and we did this very quickly. Um, one of the uh, larger organisations that we're very lucky to work with is Hortus Cariocas. Um, it's a municipal scale uh, project that does the same thing, only better. Um, and it works with residents to make organic gardens in favelas and the public school system. Um, this project that I was invited to participate in um, ended up being the largest urban organic food garden in Latin America. Uh, it was help, instrumental in helping transform one of Rio's most violent f favelas. It involved removing 450 tonnes of garbage and building more than 300 garden beds. It's more than a kilometre long and it services, services several favela communities. It's open and free and maintained by residents. And these gardens demonstrate how ground up actions can lead to real changes in access and affordable and healthy uh, food for people that need it most. In Kenya, uh, one teacher is taking a hands-on approach to working in similar ways uh, with water security. And he's, uh, he's creating water security projects with his kids at the School for the Deaf. And the kids then communicate and study these projects um, through writing about them. Uh, this friend of mine, Tom Kleepak, um, uh, teaches in Maine and his he teaches teenage girls pre-calculus, and here he is teaching them the relationship of urban uh, 
uh, pre-calculus and its relationship to urban density with rope and tent stakes at the Arts Academy in Maine. And here he is teaching chemistry and students here are taking water measure measurements and analysing them out on a lake. And the data is fed into a statewide database that tracks the health of the lakes. Another thing that he does is he gets his students to go strain the water from their local streams and rivers to help them understand the extent in which microplastics are now ubiquitous in US waterways. In northern Idaho, uh, Jamie Esler teaches his takes his class into the mountains to measure declining snowpack. Uh, students also use math to calculate how many trees are needed to offset offset the amount of carbon dioxide produced on their drives to school and then by their entire class and their hometown, etc. So they get to understand the scale and the enormity of the problem. This is interesting because in this town, more than half the people don't believe in climate change. A few online resources for you. Welcome to the Anthropocene. You probably know this. This is a, an online, um, it was developed between Sweden and Australia. Great project, check it out. Um, another one just launched, Big History Project. There's two sites, it's also School Big History Project. Um, and this is a very media rich social studies course. It's open, free um, and online. Lessons are flexible and can be customised. Um, this is another one, Skype the Scientist. It's also free and online. Teachers can request to interact with scientists from 20 different categories and Skype into the classroom for a Q&A. Um, to either talk about what it's like to be a scientist or to discuss a scientific uh, problem, like is global warming real, do squids fart, I don't know, whatever you want to talk about, they're up for it. There are more than 500 scientists available to video chat in conversation with students. Source maps are also great, there's lots of beta tools online for them. Um, students can work to develop them uh, from what exists online or in the classroom to figure out how, you know, how far salad ingredients travel to get to their plate or how much water footprint an individual uses depending on where you live. Uh, this artist here um, takes an inverse approach to, um, to tracing a, a product. Um, she spent three years finding out where a single pig from a factory farm went. Um, uh, the products ended up in things like ammunition, medicine, photo paper, even heart valves and hair conditioner. And she's produced a great book on this. Uh, Nils Norman works uh, fabricating mobile vehicles to create libraries. This is an old uh, project of his um, uh, where he's got a library and a, a weather station. And these are designed for students to go out into the field and experience space in different ways. Uh, truck farm is a great project. These artists made an old um, pickup truck into a farm, I mean into a mobile garden and they've driven around and they now go to different uh, places and, and showcase that work with different uh, groups of kids. These are locative media projects um, where you can, there's two types of locative media projects that are interesting to work with, uh, that are typical to work with. One is um, an annotative project which virtually tags objects situated in space, which is what Jeffrey Warren does, where he goes out with weather balloons, um, or phenomenological projects which trace the action of subjects that move through space, such as this project um, which maps urban air pollution by monitoring pigeons fitted with remote sensors. There are lots of alternative ways to research and understand geographic signatures for cataloguing systems. This is um, an artist who um, catalogues deformed amphibians. Here's another one who, um, who illustrates deformations in the insects that she archives near nuclear facilities. This artist, Mark Dion, he, um, he, ex he does excavations in groups with students. And um, this is one of him unearthing um, whatever was on the, the foreshore at London Bridge. And then that was uh, exhibited at the um, Tate Museum in London. My work has done this stuff in the favelas where I curate garbage collections from what I, all the trash, I'm taking tons of trash out before I can build a garden. And this is a reaction for me to why certain sites aren't considered um, historically significant enough to warrant this sort of work, particularly areas like slums that are always overlooked. Um, and lastly, 
This was a broad series of actions and installations I worked on with a physician in New Mexico in 2009 where we created an installation using three and a half tonnes of coal, the average amount used by every American every year. Uh, we placed the coal in paper bags and we delivered it in, into the hands of state legislators. Um, hundreds of people worked on this in a protest um, against the environmental health risks of fossil fuels in the lead up to the UN Climate Change Conference in the state that I was living in. And we also helped youth to draft a bill that called for a statewide cap and trade legislation on fossil fuels and they presented it on the, on the, on the floor to the, leg on the legislative floor and it was passed. Um, and the students also went out and did a documentary where they were asking people about how they, um, where people, if they knew where people, where their uh, electricity came from. And out of 100 people that the students asked, only two knew where their electricity came from. So what I've tried to demonstrate tonight is that any discourse is dependent on its language. And if we think of disciplines or issues as language communities, we can think of creativity as a translation device that can help bridge these environments for learning and knowledge exchange, to evolve what educational landscapes look like, for what counts as knowledge and for how information is absorbed and communicated, and to redefine what creative environmental pedagogy um, and how it, what, what it is and how it can advance sustainability goals in the 21st century. Whew, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Liam. So you will get play this. Oh, thank thank you. you. And I wish we could listen to everybody for much longer time, but now it's time for break, so I give you 15 minutes and then we are back. So please help yourselves. Hey. 